First, I'd like to explain why I chose Bob Dylan for my subtitle. As you will remember... Then you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone For the times they are changing I won't play the whole song for you, I think you get the idea there. So Bob Dylan won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2016, as you'll recall, for having created new poetic expressions within the great American song tradition. And he was the first songwriter to win the award. Now, it, it occurred to me that songs are bite-sized chunks of content, tasty appetizers, not full-on meals. Seems like we have a, a food analogy going on today, so we'll see if the next speaker picks up on that as well. So stay with me here. The small chunks of content kind of mirrors what we're doing in documentation as well. We're creating smaller chunks of content and new expressions within the documentation tradition. And who knows, maybe someday one of us will win the Nobel Prize for our efforts. So I did this presentation as kind of a reality check. For the last couple years, I've been working as a lone writer in a small company. And lately, I've been getting requests from managers and subject matter experts to loosen up the language I was using in my docs, to make them more conversational. And my first response was to resist. And then I noticed that other docs were sounding more conversational. And I wondered, have I gotten stuck in my ways? Am I somehow encapsulated inside my own little echo chamber? So I did this presentation to answer a few questions. Has the language we use in technical communication really changed? And are my old school mentors' rules still valid? I'm talking about rules like use questions sparingly, don't use contractions, avoid exclamation points, and never use idioms or cultural references. I also wanted to check how style guides have changed. It's been a while since I had looked at any style guides besides my own, and I wanted to find out what had changed there. I also wanted to find out how other writers feel about the language, so I constructed a survey, and we'll review the responses to that survey today. Finally, I wanted to find out what other writers are actually doing. So we'll look at a few real life examples of language innovations and documentation. So what's changing? The good news, not everything. Passive voice, still out. Clear, concise communication is always in style, though it's not always used. But the English language used in many tech docs has a less formal and more friendly, more conversational tone these days. For example, we used to say enables all the time. Now I'm seeing a lot more lets, as in this product lets you rule the world. And instead of press or tap when we got the touch screens coming on board, I've been seeing more hit as in hit OK or hit enter. And the word hit used to be taboo for us writers for so long because of the literal meaning of the word hit. But writers are starting to embrace it, and perhaps that's because its ambiguity works for multiple interfaces. So hit me up after this talk, and I'll be happy to discuss that further. We're also starting to see more idioms and expressions and even some pop culture references. Back to the food analogies. Some of this seems like junk food writing to me. Words and phrases that are added like sugar and fat to make the content more tasty. And maybe that's okay if it gets users to eat their vegetables and read the docs. And it might be good for both usability and comprehension but we'll need further study to find out. And we do know that there are different rules for different schools of docs. The rules that apply depend on the doc type and purpose. We've already heard in the previous presentation about reference material, tutorials, how-tos, 
those kinds of things. So different styles for different kinds. It also depends on the product being documented, the company style, branding, and voice, and even the content type, whether it's concept, task, reference, troubleshooting, that kind of thing, and the audience and environment. Daniela and I must have been on the same line because I have an airline analogy for you. The operating instructions for a Boeing 777 must be clear and concise. We don't want pilots tripping over needless words or interpreting idioms when they're troubleshooting flying our plane. So I looked at style guides, and here are just three of them. There are style guides for every company and product and audience. The Chicago Manual of Style, perhaps you've heard of it. 111 years old this year and in its 17th edition. And the little book, Strunk and White's Elements of Style, continues to be a touchstone for writers everywhere. So I wanted to focus on the, the guidance in the Microsoft Manual of Style just to choose one. It's used by many documentarians, not just those at Microsoft. And it's been around for 22 years. And each edition has grown by about 40 pages. So it's a good one to look at what might have been changing in the language of our documentation. So what's changed? They added a bunch of new chapters in the latest version. Chapters on global content, bias-free communication, gesture guidelines, social media guidelines, even strategies for search engine optimization. And they introduced new terms. From the first to the fourth edition, we had Java, JavaScript, URL, blog, app, cloud, email lost its hyphen, website became one word in lowercase. And there's a general shift to a friendlier tone in the Microsoft Manual of Style. Last, I thought it was very interesting that correct and incorrect in the examples became Microsoft Style and not Microsoft Style. So it is, it's very um, indicative that style depends, is still a matter of opinion, and it depends on what you're doing with your documentation from company to company. So today we'll compare what writers are saying and doing with guidance from old school mentors in the Microsoft Manual of Style. Guidance like use questions sparingly, don't try to be funny, use contractions to create a friendly conversational tone, use exclamation points sparingly, and be careful with idioms and cultural references. They can get your, hot, your docs into hot water. And of course, Bill Strunk's great advice to omit needless words. About the survey, the language survey went out to um, links on Tech World and um, other uh, mailing lists like LinkedIn. And we got 150 responses. And they came from managers, writers, and editors. And yes, there are still a few editors working in the tech writing field. 55% of respondents reported having more than 16 years of experience, so it was a fairly experienced group. To get a feel for the writing style, I asked respondents to describe what they were doing at their current gig. Now, some took issue with the word gig. It sounded like slang to them. So it's likely that respondents had somewhat conservative views. 37% said they used DITA, or a topic-based approach, and many reported following Chicago or the Microsoft Manual of Style. The surprising thing to me was that 10% reported anything goes as far as style. Their content didn't follow any specific guidelines at all. And the reason for this, some of them said, was because they received content directly from subject matter experts who didn't follow style guides and they had no time to edit. So you can see that opens the door to language innovation and documentation. Quick word about today's examples. They're mostly from online software documentation that's publicly available. The products are productivity and enterprise software, APIs, instant messaging apps, and the audiences were end users, administrators, and developers. Now the examples are not representative of all docs. They're not intended to be. Many documentarians follow traditional guidelines for language. I went looking for outliers. In these examples, I've cloaked the company names as best I could, providing you an idea of the web page, but still not showing the company name so that we can focus on the content. 
There are references at the end of this deck if you're interested to see where they came from. And last, there's no judgment in this presentation. I'm not exploring what's causing the innovations, whether it's con conscious rule breaking or something else. The goal is just to look at the language innovations and begin to consider their impact on readability, comprehension, and localization. So let's look at how questions are used in documentation. Now my old school mentors suggested that you don't use questions in the docs, and the style guide recommends using them sparingly. So what are writers doing? In a quick start guide for developers, the introduction starts with this question. Ready to add voice communication to your iOS apps? Some might call this a needless phrase, but others might see it as sending, setting a friendly, welcoming tone. Also notice that the subject you is implied makes it feel more conversational. This online training module starts with three questions back to back. Are you new to the product? Don't know where you should start on your learning journey? Not exactly sure what it is or how to use it? And it ends with a fourth question, what is product anyway? Not exactly sparing usage, but it sets a tone and it might connect with users. It's okay to have lots of questions when you're starting out. Next, this user guide speaks directly to the audience, identifying their role. While all of this is great, you're a mobile app developer, right? This adds a touch of empathy and humanity to the content. In a note following instructional content for developers, we find the question, need some help? Followed by the phrase, code is hard. I don't know if you remember the talking Barbie doll that Mattel Corporation recalled a few years ago. One of the phrases she said was, math class is tough. The company didn't realize the phrase could be construed as sexist or patronizing, usability testing there, until after the doll was released. Did the writer intend to conjure that image? I'm not sure, but that's what came to mind for me, and it added another layer of meaning. Not sure it added to the actual usability of the guide, though. Wait, no judgment. Did I say that? No judgment. All right. Now let's look at how humor is used. My old school mentors taught me to avoid humor in tech docs, and our style guide has this advice, don't try to be funny, which is advice to live by. <laughs> so clearly there are risks and rewards with using humor. It can be misinterpreted or easily becomes dated. On the plus side, it can make content more interesting, more memorable. It might even enhance learning and comprehension. But there is an important distinction between negative humor and positive humor. So negative humor comes at the expense of one party. Do we have any Brits in the house? Anyone from the UK here? Awesome. A car guy I know loves to say that the reason classic British sports cars don't have radios is that they couldn't figure out how to make them leak oil. <laughs> now you might find that funny unless you design British sports cars. Positive humor, on the other hand, doesn't rely on put-downs. One example from American comedian Stephen Wright is, you can't have everything, where would you put it? It's a tough crowd, I can see. <laughs> <laughs> so positive humor can enhance connections between the writer, the reader, and the information being presented, and it can be an effective teaching tool, whereas negative humor might offend an audience and inhibit comprehension. So the survey, I asked, Did you use, do you use humor in your, in your docs? And most respondents said they play it safe and rarely or never use humor. To my disappointment, I didn't find any actual jokes or one-liners in my doc review, but I did find examples of slang, and clearly some writers are attempting to use humor and colorful language in their docs. The first example here is inline text or microcopy next to the delete button on a project settings page. It says, delete this project permanently. This is one doodle that can't be undid, home skillet. <laughs> By a show of hands, who knows what a home skillet is? 
Honestly, I had to look it up. Urban Dictionary says it's like a homie or a homeboy or a close friend, home, home girl. <coughs> and I was so impressed with this innovative turn of phrase that I Googled it. I was surprised to learn that the line had been used in, in a movie, the 2007 comedy Juno. Here's a quick clip from the film. Now, oh, there it is. The little pink plus sign is so unholy. That ain't no inch of sketch. This is one doodle that can't be undid, Holmes Killett. <laughs> Now, most readers won't know it's a line from the movie, unless they're studying language innovation and documentation and actively looking for this kind of thing. But now that you've seen where it comes from, does it add to or detract from your experience with the app? And does it impact your comprehension or make the content more memorable? In our next example, instead of showing a simple reference table with field names on one side and their definitions on the other, the writer included creative non-examples. Records are not vinyl, fields are not meadows, and objects are not UFOs. In the world of instructional design, non-examples highlight distinctions among items and make content more memorable. Now, some might consider these non-examples to be needless words, especially if you're paying for translation by the word. They're unrelated to the product. But they do add flavor to the field definition table. And for this reader, it made me more likely to read on to see what else the writer might throw into the docs. In this online training manual, the writer used humor when explaining the concept of multi-tenancy. They wrote, multi-tenancy is a great word for making you sound smart at dinner parties. The humor is positive, it doesn't come at the expense of anyone, except perhaps for the unsuspecting guests at the dinner party. And this lighthearted conceptual passage uses humor to create a sense of empathy for the poor reader who's slogging through the boring user guide. Before you close out this window in a frantic attempt to avoid learning about what seems like a boring subject, sit tight. And it ends with a cake analogy, back to the food. Sometimes it helps to think of it as a cake, because cake is delicious and it makes everything better. <laughs> Another example of positive humor, everyone wins with delicious cake. Now let's look at how docs use contractions, exclamation points, and emojis. The old school said to avoid contractions because they complicate localization. Translators might have trouble knowing whether it means it is, or it was, or it has. And exclamation points had no place in tech docs. Emojis weren't even on the radar. The style guide encourages the use of contractions to create a friendly conversational style. That was a big change for me. It still recommends using exclamation points sparingly, and there's no current guidance on using emojis in tech docs. In the survey, I asked um, if people aim for a personable conversational style, and the majority reported that they rarely or never do. 28% said they sometimes do, and 13% said it was definitely a goal. As for contractions, the sur survey showed that although the mi mi minority of respondents report never using contractions, others are clearly embracing them. They were slightly less likely to use future contractions, like you will or we'll, however. As for exclamation points, some people were using them, some people were even using two at a time, and some people reported using emojis. Here's an example of microcopy in an app. Artwork here is done. It's personable and friendly. The exclamation point indicates enthusiasm and energy. And the contraction in the second sentence, let's choose a way to send your survey, is clearly more friendly than the more formal let us. In a procedure for developers, an example of a negative contradiction and an exclamation point. Interesting that it's in parentheses. Don't include admin in the subdomain. With an exclamation point. So the sentence appears in parentheses as if it's in a whisper. Would your interpretation be different if the sentence ended with a period? Another conceptual overview shows future tense contractions. 
it'll give you a custom overview instead of the more formal it will give or the present tense it gives. And the topic ends with a few other goodies. In this online user's guide, the writer achieved a conversational tone by using contractions for every to be verb except for the one after product name, which is likely a company branding style. And of course, we have Osnap, the familiar error message, a slang phrase popularized in hip hop music. It's been translated into many different languages, so localization didn't appear to be a concern here. As for emojis, we are seeing them. This one was in a messaging app, not surprisingly. It says, my human friends have given me lots of emoji tips to share with you. And the missing word is awesome with an exclamation point. Idioms and expressions like tickle your fancy. They can work provided you catch their drift, but they are gobbledygook for English language learners and translators. Okay, I'll quit with that stuff. My old school mentors advised against using idioms and expression, and the style guide said to use them only with caution. What did our survey say? I gave a few examples, and writers said they would be very reluctant to use any of them. But I found a few. In an online training module, we read visualized data on the fly. And in a getting started guide for developers, we find take it for a spin, it being the app, and spin meaning to test it out, and time to get your feet wet, meaning to experience firsthand how to use the app. Now what about the choice of a period over an exclamation point in this sentence? Periods seem to indicate a more literal interpretation, whereas exclamation points seem to soften phrases. It's as if the <coughs> signaling text should be interpreted with a wink. And this one doesn't. So it was an interesting choice. In another messaging app, we read, this guide will help you get to know product like the back of your hand, as well as a waving hand emoji in the, in the content. And on an account creation form, the system responds with polite, supportive phrases when you type your information. Uh, your name, nice to meet you. You're on a roll. And your password, mom's the word. Again, intended to create empathy and give the user a sense that the system has a personality. Now let's look at pop culture references in some colorful language. The guidance says to avoid such references or use them only with caution. In the survey, more than 80% of respondents said they would never use the examples I gave, fictional characters or killer robots. And the remaining 20% said they would do so only rarely or sometimes. Very few said they attempt to integrate such references into their docs. However, I did find a few examples. With fictional characters in a code sample used for developer instructions, there's Tony Stark, AKA Iron Man, from the Mar Marvel comics and the email address Tony at Avengers. If the audience is familiar with Marvel characters, this might make it, the content more engaging for them than if the writer had used the more typical John Smith and John at example.com. In a software training module, I was elated to find a, con a conceptual paragraph devoted to killer robots as well as other rad stuff. If you'll indulge me, and if I have time, I'd like to just read this passage for you. It is wonderful. For most of us, everything we've learned about artificial intelligence, AI, we've learned from Hollywood. There are the time-traveling robots trying to kill us before we can have children who will someday lead the future rebellion against <laughs> said robots. Or evil machines using humans as batteries in giant factories, providing a power source to said evil machines. But unless we're talking about summer blockbusters, that's not what AI is really about. Instead, AI is about making your daily experiences smarter by embedding predictive intelligence into your everyday apps. So this writer has managed to put a whole bunch of words that maybe are not necessarily important to the subject at hand, but make the content more interesting. It's also an, an example of a non-example. AI is not killer robots. I wondered how would it translate, so I looked at the Spanish version. 
My Spanish skills are rusty, but it appears to be a fairly direct translation. How effective is the Hollywood reference for a global audience? We need further research to find out, of course. In API developer instructions, we find now comes a wonky bit. Another word I had to look up. The word wonky certainly adds spice to the documentation, and it made me wonder, how would users feel about the process after reading that it was slightly wonky? Another interesting turn of phrase appears in conceptual information for developers to get started on the road to serverless bliss. The literal definition of bliss, of course, is complete happiness, and most English speakers probably don't read this literally. They get that going serverless might be nice, but it won't actually bring them complete happiness. But it might have a different meaning when interpreted literally. And in an administrator's guide, we find a reference to Tulsa time. The passage explains the concept that the report time is based on the main server location, not the user's location. So if the user is located in Prague, but the main server is located in Tulsa, the time you specify for the report is interpreted as Tulsa time. So by a show of hands, did anyone pick up on a hidden reference in that passage? Yes, my man, back in the back. For those who didn't pick up on it, the example still makes perfect sense. For those who did pick up on it, the reference might make the concept more memorable. It ties new information to information you already have about Tulsa time. In instructional design, this is one of the primary methods of teaching adult learners, making content relevant and tying it to information they already know. It makes it more memorable. So at the risk of planting an unwanted earworm, I'd like you to help me with an experiment. Remembering that if you're in Prague and the server is in Tulsa, the time for the report is Tulsa time. I give you the sweet country stylings of Don Williams and his band performing the classic Tulsa time. There might be a quiz later to see whether the concept or the song stuck with you. And unfortunately, we lost Don on Friday, so that was a, a sad note, but uh, still a, one of the greats, gentle giant. So what are the takeaways today? Styles are changing. Even the lagging indicators, our style guides, are recommending a more conversational tone. And language innovations abound. <coughs> Changes are not across the board, but you can find the innovations if you look for them. Writers are not only making content more conversational, they're peppering it with pop culture references, idioms, emojis, and exclamation points. What some might consider needless words are being used frequently, perhaps to make the content more palatable, more empathetic, or approachable. However, some of the rules still apply. Despite the innovations, active voice, present tense, and short, concise sentences are still usually easier to read. And in general, the documentarians I survey believe that readers still want docs to get to the meat of the content immediately and get out of the way. And of course, all of this needs further study. So if there are any PhD candidates in the room, I recommend this as, as perhaps a topic for your consideration. To paraphrase Bob Dylan one last time, the docs, they are a change in. So I hope this presentation has served to whet your appetite for that change and that it will inspire you to keep your eyes peeled for innovations in the language of documentation going forward. And one more thing, adaptability is key. I'll leave you with a little David Bowie if I can get my sound guy to turn it up a little bit to make up for that Tulsa time year work. Thank you all. Keep rocking it up. Still don't know what I was waiting for And my time was running wild A million dead-end streets and 
Every time I thought I got it made, it seemed the taste was not so sweet. So I turned myself to face me, but I've never caught a glimpse of 